let me uh, let me resume the meeting and welcome the second panel. Uh, let me introduce the second panel. We have Miss Elizabeth uh, Yampierre, the executive director of Upros. Ms. Nadia Nazar, co-founder, co-executive, director of Zero Hour Movement. Dr. Kim Cobb, professor of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences and the director of the Global Change Program and the Georgia Institute of Technology. Ms. Paula, Ms. Paula De Pirma, special advisor, CDP North America. Uh, Reverend Lennox Yearwood, president and CEO of Hip Hop Caucus. Mr. Derek Holly, president of Reaching America and Dr. Judith Curry, President of Climate Forecast Applications Networks. As with the first panel, oral statements are limited to five minutes. Your entire statement uh, will be part of the hearing records. I explain the lights. Uh, yellow means you have a minute. Red uh, for uh, the sake of everybody having their questions and additional time to uh, engage with the witnesses today. Uh, we would. Uh, we would hope that you would stop at that point. And uh, I want to thank uh, uh, the chair. Let me begin. Let me begin with Ms. Uh, Nazar. Uh, your five minutes. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to your comments and your perspective. So. Thank you for inviting me to be here today. I would first like to acknowledge that we are on the land of the Piscataway Indian Nation, an indigenous tribe. My name is Nadia Nazar. I am 16 years old and I am a junior in high school in Baltimore, Maryland. I am an artist and environmentalist. I have dedicated my time and efforts to the community and animals on this planet since I was 12 years old. I am a founder of the youth-led climate organization Zero Hour. We say this is zero hour because this is zero hour to act on climate change. In fact, zero hour will soon launch a nationwide campaign for youth camera. to educate their parents down, about climate justice. Climate change has already impacted my future. Scientists say we will be at irreversible climate chaos by the year 2030 if we don't drastically reduce our emissions right now. I will be 28 years old in 2030. Our world is already experiencing the impacts of global warming and living conditions will only get closer and closer to the extremes. Humanity has pushed this planet to the edge, and from my view, it seems that few in the policy and political world are paying attention to the consequences of our actions over the generations. The climate crisis exasperates problems that are already prevalent, especially in developing nations. Clean water, a vital element to life, is becoming even more scarce. Extreme weather and natural disasters are now the norm, creating new crises against vulnerable populations. The U.S. is historically the largest emitter of greenhouse gases, but those who are facing the most severe consequences are the people in developing countries and those in lower income communities. People in poverty have less access to resources needed to survive when climate extremes take place. Marine life, such as sea turtles and whales and other species, are facing a mass extinction because of the warmer ocean waters that we humans have caused. My community in Baltimore depends on the Chesapeake Bay. These warming waters will not only harm future generations of my community, but it will also harm generations around the world that rely on bodies of water for their livelihoods. It seems here in Washington that policymakers have for far too long put the interests of fossil fuel corporations and other carbon emitting industries over the health and prosperity of the people, the wildlife, and this planet. The lives of my generation have been disregarded for far too long. You should put the interests of your future generations first, not just because it is the right thing to do, but because many of us have the right to vote in just a couple of years. We care about clean air and clean water, and we'll be voting for those who want to address climate change head on. Some of my friends say they don't want to have children because they're worried about the kind of lives they would have to live on a warming planet. In the future, asthma rates will be higher, there will be less access to food, and more extreme natural disasters and weather will occur, all due to climate change. Climate change not only threatens the future of my generation, but it continues to displace and kill people. My family in Kerala, India, experienced the floods that occurred there this past summer. These floods displaced approximately 800,000 people and killed 483 people. 
Around the same time, my friends in Ellicott City, Maryland, experienced floods that caused landslides and infrastructural damage in a historical city. Climate change has been happening. Climate change is happening. Climate change will continue to happen. Climate change is my future unless you do something about it right now. My generation includes your children and your grandchildren. I see climate change as an issue that connects everyone and everything on our planet. This is not just about changes in the weather. It's about these changes that will impact and harm populations all around the world. If there's no food, if there's no food because plants can't grow due to extreme drought, that can cause war. And the most vulnerable populations oppressed by racism, the patriarchy, colonialism, and more will be the ones who suffer. These are the people who are so often left out of conversations. Conversations about the quality of the air and water, about energy, and about how we treat this land. We at Zero Hour believe that not only the, of the, the voices of the nation's youth have been ignored, but others as well. Women, people of color, indigenous communities, and some of our most vulnerable populations. How can we progress towards an equal and equitable society of justice if we can't listen to those who make up our country? I believe that everyone must work together, united and with compassion on this issue. Those who hold the most power and influence in our society should work with those working in our local communities. I ask of you, Congress, to work with the grassroots climate movement, including the youth, and listen to them in order to bring sustainable change swiftly in time for my generation and I to be able to enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Napier, uh, Ms. Executive Director, uh, floor is yours. Buenos dias. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Yon Pierre. I'm the co-chair of the Climate Justice Alliance, an intergenerational alliance of more than 68 frontline community organizations, movement networks, and movement support groups rooted in indigenous, African American, Latinx, Asian Pacific Islander, and poor white communities living on the front lines of climate change, as well as the dig, burn, drive, dump industries causing the climate crisis. I'm also executive director of UPROSE. It's a woman of color-led intergenerational organization founded in 1966, dedicated to environmental and social justice. We're home to the largest gathering of young people of color on climate justice, the Climate Justice Youth Summit. We're located in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, a diverse community of color made up predominantly of people of color and immigrants. We have a poverty rate of nearly 26% above the city average and far above the national average. From a climate perspective, we're an industrial waterfront community exposed to flooding from hurricanes and storm surges, as was the case in 2012 with Superstorm, when Superstorm Sandy hit. Like climate change, the conditions of our communities are the consequence of a long history of extraction. We share legacies of fighting colonialism as well as race, class, and gender oppression while advocating for environmental justice. Our communities are the first and most impacted by the storms, fires, floods, and droughts, and are disproportionately burdened by the pollution, poverty, and systemic violence associated with the multinational corporations driving this, these ecological crises. Puerto Rico is the most recent and drastic example of a land ravaged by corporate extraction, with people left to fend for themselves after years of colonialism, austerity, and neglect. The double disasters of Hurricane Maria, Hurricanes Maria and Irma created an opportunity for disaster capitalists to profit from people suffering in a time of social and economic devastation. The same thing took place in the Gulf South for black and indigenous communities after Hurricane Katrina. Climate change solutions must honor human rights and respect frontline leadership through the solutions that are proposed. Elsewhere, the extractive economy continues to harm entire communities, as is the case with uranium mining in New Mexico, which affects over 60 indigenous nations. The southwest U.S. was declared a national sacrifice zone in the federal energy policy of the 1970s. This means that environmental safeguards were not enforced, thus endangering human life. Drinking water is tainted with uranium and arsenic, and there is a high rate of cancer, heart disease, and lung disease. 
Uranium mining is a key element of nuclear energy, which is considered renewable energy in most federal energy, clean energy policy initiatives. You can understand why we do not support the use of large-scale biofuel, biomass, mega-hydro dams, nuclear energy, or energy derived from burning waste. They are usually developed, developed in our backyards where we live, work, play, and pray, and they do not reduce emissions at the source of extraction, only prolonging any real solutions to the climate crisis. To effectively tackle climate change, we must invest in a just transition. A just transition will not be smooth, but must be just, leaving no worker or community behind. Frontline communities and an economic framework that moves us away from extraction must be at the center of any effort to address climate change. All around the country, there are examples of frontline communities developing projects that engage in innovative infrastructure, further control, um, and create jobs. Some are at the early stages, while others are ready to be scaled up and replicated. They will benefit more people and communities if there's political will, public investment, and incentives to do so. The fossil fuel industry receives millions in subsidies. Imagine what communities already foreseen comprehensive solutions to the climate crisis could do with the reallocation of these subsidies. My organization, UPROS, just recently partnered with the New York City Economic Development Corporation, Solar One and Co-op Power, to create the first community-owned solar cooperative in the state of New York. On a larger scale, we advocate for turning the area's industrial sector into an economic engine able to build for the region's climate adapt adaptation future. Offshore wind alone can develop power, deliver power to New York City, displacing the need for dirty power plants. But just as importantly, it would position the city at the center of this emerging industry, driving local economic development. For years in another part of the country, the residents of Highland Park, Michigan, suffered high energy costs and blackouts, along with massive flooding. When the municipality was in a financial crisis, the local energy company repossessed a thousand street lights, leaving the residents in the dark. Solidarity, a local environmental justice group and a CJA member stepped in and designed a system for installing solar power lights. Solidarity created a bulk purchasing program that is training residents in solar installation and weatherization, readying them to step into clean energy jobs. They are using education and organizing to literally make light of the dark of a dark situation. Frontline communities know what is at stake. The question is, will legislation aid our communities? future survival or hinder it. I hope for all of our sakes it will be the former. The bottom line is that there are no, our communities are not sacrifice zones, and they have been for too many years. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. I thank Chairman Grijalva and Ranking Member Bishop for allowing me to contribute to this important conversation about our nation's future. My message today is simple. The data and the science could not be more clear. It's time to act. There are many no regrets, win-win actions to reduce the growing costs of climate change. But we're going to have to come together to form new alliances in our home communities across our states and yes, even in Washington. I know I speak for thousands of my colleagues when I say that scientists all over the country are willing and eager to assist policymakers in the design of data-driven defenses against both current and future climate change impacts. As a professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology for the last 15 years, my research uses samples collected from the remote Pacific to reconstruct past climate variations. Our records are consistent with countless other records indicating that the rate and magnitude of recent climate change dwarf natural climate variability over the last millennium. I love my work. But three years ago, I witnessed something that would change my life forever. In 2015, we received funding from the National Science Foundation for a series of field expeditions to document the evolution of a strong El Nino event projected that winter. I had waited 15 years for this scientific opportunity. However, little did I know that warming ocean temperatures, six degrees Fahrenheit warmer than average, would kill up to 90% of the coral at our study site. And I had a front row seat to that carnage. 2016 would go on to become the worst global scale coral bleaching and mortality event on record and the warmest year on our planet since records began. Personally, 2016 was my wake up call. Unfortunately, the last years brought a number of devastating wake-up calls much closer to home. Hurricanes Harvey, Lane, and Florence decimated entire communities, 
uh, delivered record-breaking rainfall while Hurricanes Maria, Michael, decimated entire communities with their force, including many in my home state of Georgia. The National Climate Assessment, released this last November by a consortium of 13 federal agencies, documents how climate change loads the dice in favor of extreme precipitation events and how warmer oceans fuel larger tropical storms. On the other side of the country, record-breaking wildfires raged across California, linked to prolonged drought and warmer temperatures. The economic toll of these disasters can be measured in the hundreds of billions of dollars. However, their real toll, the vast human suffering left in their wake, is immeasurable. And beyond these deadly extremes, a host of additional climate change impacts represent a growing threat to ecosystems and communities alike. Sea levels are rising with up to six feet of global sea level rise projected this century. Drought threatens water supplies across the western U.S. with no end in sight. The oceans are becoming more acidic as excess carbon dioxide reacts with seawater. And as of today, 2018 will officially take its place as the fourth warmest year on record behind 2016, 17, and 15. Climate change impacts are now detectable all across America, and they will get worse. That's the bad news. I'm sure you're ready for some good news, and there is plenty to go around. The good news is that science can help inform measures to help protect communities as well as our oceans, forests, parks, waterways, and wildlife from the most devastating impacts of climate change. Here, early action is essential to the success of these approaches, delivering vast returns on investment. Many jurisdictions, from the local to the federal, have developed a suite of climate adaptation measures informed by rigorous science, stakeholder engagement, and cost-benefit analysis, but we must accelerate these efforts. Towards that end, the National Climate Assessment provides an actionable blueprint for such adaptive measures, including an in-depth assessment of climate impacts on ecosystem structure, function, and services. The other good news is that it's not too late to avoid the most damaging impacts of future climate change. We have the tools, all we need, to, we, we have the tools to, we need to dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And in doing so, we will enjoy cleaner water, cleaner air, and healthier communities. The rapid expansion of renewable energy across the nation demonstrates a strong appetite for carbon-free clean power. Even so, U.S. greenhouse gas emissions were up 3% last year. The bottom line is that we are running out of time. Comprehensive federal policies are needed to speed the transition to low carbon energy sources. Top on the list must be a price on carbon to reflect the true cost of continued fossil fuel emissions and to incentivize consumers, companies, and the market to find the cheapest, most effective means of reducing emissions. With or without a price on carbon, increased energy efficiency is a win-win strategy that can deliver energy cost savings while reducing harmful air pollution. Lastly, there is a strong case we made that we can deploy our vast forests, grasslands, and coastal marshes in service to natural carbon sequestration. At its most basic level, this means designing strategies to safeguard these environments with their rich carbon reserves in the face of continued climate change. As a climate scientist, I have to wonder, how bad will it have to get for us to recognize that climate change represents a clear and present threat and to act decisively to protect ourselves? I am heartened by recent polls showing that nearly three in four Americans are concerned about global warming and support a range of policy options to address it. As a mother to four young children, I'm inspired by the sea of young people demanding that we not squander their chances for climate stability. I urge this committee to capitalize on the vast trove of climate science findings by one, protecting our natural resources and the communities that depend on them from known climate change impacts, and two, using federal lands to advance climate solutions rather than expanding the scope of the climate change problem. Thank you. Ms. DiPerna. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. Uh, and no doubt disclosure information on our CDP platform touches all the states represented on the committee, and I thank you for your service to the nation. CDP North America, formerly known as the Carbon Disclosure Project, is a nonprofit that operates for the public good. Today, roughly 500 companies in the United States, including 70% of the S&P 500, disclose to us and through us their quantitative and qualitative information about environmental performance, their environmental performance, and the imperatives they perceive. Our standardized annual information request is signed off on by roughly 500 investor enterprises who represent over $94 trillion in cumulative assets and most of the financial service sector of the world. 
Our signatories use disclosure as a gauge on corporate strategic advantages and vulnerabilities and a reference for making investment decisions. If you stroll through our data, you would find there are more than 15 years of evidence of the doability, desirability, and necessity of reducing greenhouse gas emissions to address climate change expressed voluntarily by companies themselves, many of whose shareholders are public pension funds and thus relevant to much of the American people. As for me, you have my full resume, but suffice it to say here that I've seen the climate change issue from 360 degrees, from coral reefs to carbon markets, literally, working closely with both economist Richard Sandor to help and design the world's first integrated cap and trade, the pioneering Chicago climate exchange, and with oceans explorer Jacques Cousteau, seeing the first President Bush twice at the Oval Office to discuss climate change. President Bush signed the United States to the landmark framework convention on climate change, to which the United States remains a signatory, even if the U.S. has pulled out of the Paris Agreement, and we now stand alone among nations outside the global consensus and also likely missing out on opportunities to use coherent policy, state and local, and federal, to maximize jobs creation and future-proof our crumbling infrastructure. Sometimes it is said that American companies are concerned that strong policies will hurt business. On the contrary, companies are quite concerned about climate change itself, and following I will share with you a few examples from almost all of your districts and states, and probably all, and refer you to my written testimony and other materials uh, of CDP uh, for further details. In Arizona and Colorado, for example, Arizona Public Services, 6,300 new employees serving 1.2 million customers, has said, risks associated with forest fires are not new, but scientists have indicated that as the global temperatures increase, there is a greater risk of drought and a correlated increase in risk and intensity of forest fires. Potential threat is very real. Of course, we've heard very much today about the burning in California. It's not only the trees. The downgrade of most of the utilities in California affects directly American people. Uh, the, the, the credit rating downgrade is very, very significant, rating companies from stable to negative by Moody's and S&P and Fitch's. In Connecticut, Stanley Black & Decker, employer of nearly 60,000 Americans, has stated, climate change can have potentially devastating impacts on our supply chain should drought or flood occur. In Ohio, American Electric Power, which has 17,500 employees and 5 million customers across 11 states, including Texas, Louisiana, Kentucky, and West Virginia, in their SEC filing has said, climate change risk is considered a major and material issue for AEP. And on the issue of regulatory uncertainty, AEP is on the record as saying, and additionally, additionally in recent years, legal challenges to almost every major EPA rulemaking have added additional uncertainty and cost. While environmental regulations mentioned will have a large impact on our operations, the uncertainty regarding climate change regulation or legislation is a more challenging risk to manage. In Texas, companies such as Chevron, DuPont, and Total have described risks in their disclosure pertinent to the need for storm barrier protection for oil facilities. Florida, Harris Corporation, close to 17,000 employees, is worried that their data centers will be affected as temperatures rise and they lose, quote, ambient cooling potential. On the supply chain front, Johnson & Johnson, based in New Jersey with 134,000 employees, 134, global employees, is worried about climate change, extreme weather, disrupting not only demand for products, but disruptions in manufacturing and distribution networks of vital medicines and, af and afraid that it will affect the overall design and integrity of our products and operations. Atlanta, Coca-Cola, 90,000 companies, is worried about agricultural products, including sugarcane, corn, and citrus. Coca-Cola has said the affordability of our products and ultimately our business could be negatively impacted. In Nevada, even Caesars Palace is not immune from climate change. Its parent has said it virtually, cer virtually certain to see short-term increase in cost due to uh, a shortage of precipitation. Even before the Paris Agreement, we were getting risks on, on supply chain. Uh, and if it wasn't from soup to nuts, it's soup to tomatoes. For example, Campbell Soup cited water risks and climate change as very significant and of concern. And ConAgra has said, quote, they've seen delayed tomato harvesting due to unseasonably cool weather. 
Dr. Pepper, of course, is worried about water. It's one of their main ingredients and has said a portion of our cost of sales, or $2.5 billion, could be at risk through increased costs to our supply chain. I could go on and on. I will not. I know my time is up, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Uh, Reverend Yearwood, floor is yours, sir. Thank you to Chairman Gahalva and the entire committee for having me here today. And thank you to the other panelists for your commitment to solving climate change, especially Love, Zero Hour, and Uprose. My name is Reverend Lennox Yearwood, Jr. I am the President and CEO of the Hip Hop Caucus, and all of you Republicans and Democrats are invited to be part of the Hip Hop Caucus. That was a little joke there to start off the testimony. <laughs> but let me get right to it. As Americans, we face challenges head on. Climate change is not a Democrat issue or a Republican issue. It is a human issue. This crisis is complex. It impacts all of us and future generations. And those with the least resources are impacted first and worse. But we know how to solve this crisis. We must make a just transition off of fossil fuels to a 100% clean, renewable energy economy that works for all. Many communities, cities, and states across our country are leading the way on climate solutions. I urge every member of this committee to visit places and people who have gone through climate disasters and visit communities, projects, and businesses that are implementing clean energy and climate solutions. When you visit these communities, it will become very clear that climate change is a civil and human rights issue. In 1960, four African-American college students sat at the Woolworths lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina to desegregate the South. They were courageous beyond belief in standing up for equality. Today, Young people like Nadia across the table from me and across this country are courageously standing up not only for equality, but for our existence. Climate change is our lunch counter moment for the 21st century. Young people are organizing, marching, and coalition building, and they are leading the call for solutions like a Green New Deal. They are doing it because they know that the science on climate change is undeniable. But also because, like all of us here today, they have watched as people have died in Hurricanes Harvey, Maria, Irma, Katrina, and Superstorm Sandy. They have seen the families who have lost everything to fires that have ripped across the West. They have been part of peaceful movements opposing fossil fuel developments led by the Lakota people at Standing Rock and the Gwich'in people in the Arctic Refuge. So the question is, what are you, as members of this committee, going to do? It is my prayer that you call up at least as much courage as young people standing up around the country, and that you act, you act now, and you act boldly and courageously. If this committee and both chambers of Congress don't urgently come together, put the people of this country first, put God first, and put your political party to the side to solve climate change, we don't make it beyond 12 years from now without huge amounts of death, destruction, and suffering. As an officer in the United States Air Force Reserve Chaplain Corps, I had to ponder the unique relationship between military and faith. In the military, we need our faith not only to strengthen us in battle, but we need our faith to guide us to do what is right. We need you to use your faith to guide you to do what is right. 
if you are approaching climate change or climate or climate as a partisan political issue, your faith is leading you astray. We, the American people, need you to have courage to do what is right. It is your courage. It is your courage. It is your courage that can put our country and the world on the path of solving climate change. In the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools. Thank you, and may God be with you and with us all. Mr. Holly, the uh, floor is yours, sir. Greetings, Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Derek Holly, President of Reach of America, an organization I developed to address complex social issues that are impacting the African American community. We're focused on solutions, not based on right or left wing views, but what makes sense for a more united America. One of the issues that we do the most work on is addressing and reducing energy poverty. Now, what is energy poverty? Energy poverty exists when low income families or individuals spend upwards of 30% of their total income on their electric bill. And when that happens, it puts people in tough, tough situations and have to make tough choices like, do I eat today or do I pay the electric bill? Do I get this prescription filled or do I fill up my gas tank? I can't even give the kids a couple of dollars today because I gotta pay the electric bill. And for many Americans, particularly in the minority community, we face these challenges every single day. And the community, the African-American community, we don't have the luxury to pay more for green technologies. We need access to affordable energy to help heat our homes, power our stoves, and get back and forth to work. And through Reaching America, I've had the opportunity to reach and talk to thousands of African-Americans who all talk about one thing, the question of rising cost of energy, along with the fees and subsidies that they have to pay that they don't benefit from, and how they struggle to keep up with it. Now, my passion for energy is deeply rooted. When I first graduated from college, I worked for Norfolk Southern Railroad as a brakeman. And I can couple the cars, I can switch the tracks, I know how to tighten up the brakes and everything. And so I worked at Lambert's Point in Norfolk, Virginia. And our job and responsibility was loading coal ships that transported coal all around the world. So I've always asked myself the question, if our natural resources are good enough for other countries, then why is it not good enough for us right here at home? And in addition to that, my grandfather was a black coal miner in southwest Virginia. So it's safe to say if it wasn't for the energy industry, I wouldn't be here to talk to y'all today. Now, when the government creates policies, its first priority should be the welfare of the people, especially those impacted the hardest rather than big business and special interest groups looking for a handout. I'm also a member of Project 21, a national black leadership organization. And in our blueprint for a better deal for black America, we focus on 10 key areas for reform, including minority impact assessments um, for new regulations. This would be a major step towards increasing economic opportunities and having input from governors and community leaders, much the same way that qualified opportunity zones were developed, were, will create a level of trust in communities that never existed before. After all, the government requires environmental impact studies and statements to estimate the effects of projects like roads and buildings on nature. Shouldn't the government act similarly when it comes to how regulations impact the population or a particular market segment? A minority impact assessment would create a list of all positive, all negative impacts proposed regulations would have and the factors including employment, wages, consumer prices, home ownership, job creation, etc. The regulatory impact would then be analyzed for its effect on minorities in contrast to the general population. The bottom line, any policy that contributes to energy poverty is a bad one for low income and minority communities. Fortunately, our nation has an abundant supply of natural gas that is the solution to our nation's energy questions. Recent polar vortex temperatures last week dropped so low in some areas that windmills couldn't even turn. We have to have a plan B. Um, natural gas is clean. The U.S. Energy Information Administration reports that almost two-thirds of the CO2 emissions from 2006 through 2014 
came from the fuel shifting towards natural gas. Natural gas is reliable, it's efficient, and it meets the needs of our nation's grid. And natural gas is also affordable, and for many Americans, this allows them not to have to choose to keep the lights on and feed their families. So in, close, in closing, I'm all for protecting the environment. I'm a licensed captain, I had the opportunity to take my boat to Florida and back, the intercoastal waterway is beautiful, so I'm all for the environment. However, until we, have, we figure out a way to harness the sun and the wind to sustain ourselves, we need to use what we have, especially if it can lower the cost of energy, create jobs, and boost the economy. That's my time. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Curry? I thank the chairman, the ranking member, and the committee for the opportunity to offer testimony today. I'm concerned that both the climate change problem and its solution have been vastly oversimplified. This oversimplification has led to politicized scientific debates and policy gridlock. My testimony is presented today in the spirit of acknowledging the complexity of the problem and proposing pragmatic ideas that can break the gridlock. Climate scientists have made a forceful argument for a future threat from climate change. Man-made climate change is a theory whose basic mechanism is well understood, but the potential magnitude is highly uncertain. If climate change were a simple, tame problem, everyone would agree on the solution. Because of the complexities of the climate system and its societal impacts, solutions may have surprising, unintended consequences that generate new vulnerabilities. In short, the cure could be worse than the disease. Given these complexities, there is plenty of scope for reasonable and intelligent people to disagree. Based on current assessments of the science, man-made climate change is not an existential threat on the time scale of the 21st century, even in its most alarming incarnation. However, the perception of a near-term apocalypse in alignment with a range of other social objectives has narrowed the policy options that we're willing to consider. In evaluating the urgency of emissions reductions, we need to be realistic about what this will actually accomplish. Global CO2 concentrations will not be reduced if emissions in China and India continue to increase. If we believe the climate models, any changes in extreme weather events would not be evident until late in the 21st century, and the greatest impacts will be felt in the 22nd century and beyond. People prefer clean over dirty energy, provided that the energy source is reliable, secure, and economical. However, it's misguided to assume that current wind and solar technologies are adequate for powering an advanced economy. The recent record-breaking cold outbreak in the Midwest is a stark reminder of the challenges of providing a reliable power supply in the face of extreme weather events. With regards to energy policy and its role in reducing emissions, there are currently two options in play. Option number one, do nothing, continue with the status quo. Or option number two, rapidly deploy wind and solar power plants with the goal of eliminating fossil fuels in one to two decades. Apart from the gridlock engendered by considering only these two options, in my opinion, neither gets us where we want to go. A third option is to reimagine the 21st century electric power systems with new technologies that improve energy security, reliability, and cost, while at the same time minimizing environmental impacts. However, this strategy requires substantial research, development, and experimentation. Acting urgently on emissions reduction by deploying 20th century technologies could turn out to be the enemy of a better long-term solution. Since reducing emissions is not expected to change the climate in a meaningful way until late in the 21st century, adaptation strategies are receiving increasing attention. The extreme damages from recent hurricanes, plus the billion-dollar losses from floods, droughts, and wildfires, emphasize the vulnerability of the U.S. to extreme events. But it's easy to forget that U.S. extreme weather events were actually worse in the 1930s and 1950s. 
Regions that find solutions to current impacts of extreme weather and climate events will be better prepared to cope with any additional stresses from climate change and to address near-term social justice objectives. The industry leaders that I engage with seem hungry for a bipartisan, pragmatic approach to climate policy. I see a window of opportunity to change the framework for how we approach this. Bipartisan support seems feasible for pragmatic efforts to accelerate energy innovation, build resilience to extreme weather events, pursue no regrets pollution reduction measures, and better land use practices. Each of these efforts has justifications independent of their benefits for climate change. These efforts provide the basis of a climate policy that addresses both near-term economic and social justice concerns and also the longer-term goals of mitigation. This ends my testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much and to the whole panel. Uh, our appreciation uh, for your valuable and important uh, testimony. Let me turn to uh, my colleague, Mr. Nagus, for questions. Well, first, I want to thank the chairman for, for holding this hearing. Uh, it is a breath of fresh air, particularly for us new members um, who have just joined the Congress, uh, that the Natural, Re Natural Resources Committee is, is undertaking this important work and that its first hearing is on such an important topic. Uh, you know, I, I would respectfully disagree with uh, Dr. Curry uh, in terms of your uh, framing around the, the existential nature of this issue. I think climate change is an existential threat. Uh, I think of this uh, in the context of being a new young father. Uh, I am 34 years old. My wife and I just had our first child, a uh, daughter named Natalie. She's five months old. And much of our work here in the Congress is, is ultimately making sure that the world she inherits uh, is a better one than perhaps the world that we inherited. And one need look uh, no further than the IPCC report and a variety of other studies to just see how catastrophic the consequences of climate change will be for her generation if we don't take decisive action and if we don't do so now. Uh, and I can tell you that certainly in my community in Colorado, we are feeling the impacts of climate change uh, already. Uh, I have a report here that I'll respectfully ask to be submitted into the record, uh, the most recent report from the Department of Interior with respect to the, the impacts of climate change in Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, I represent Colorado's second congressional district, northern Colorado. 52% uh, of my district is federal public land. And we see uh, very clearly the impacts of climate change in Rocky Mountain National Park uh, and elsewhere. My constituents see it every day. Rising temperatures have led to snow melting faster, which causes increased flooding and erosion and negatively impacts Colorado's fresh water supply, 70% of which comes from our snow. Uh, at Rocky Mountain National Park, uh, the studies have shown that temperatures have risen three to four degrees, significantly impact affecting the planet, excuse me, the plants and animals that call the park home. Uh, I am very excited about the opportunity to take comprehensive, holistic, and significant action to solve uh, this issue. Uh, actions like the Green New Deal, which uh, I support along with uh, several of my colleagues. Uh, I've introduced legislation to protect over 400,000 acres of public lands in my state in Colorado uh, so that we can ensure uh, that, uh, that, that those lands are not sold to the highest bidder and, and opened up to oil and gas uh, development and the rest. So uh, at the end of the day, I, I think this was the defining issue of our time. And I thank the witnesses uh, with respect to their activism uh, in trying to, to push for common sense solutions that will ultimately protect the planet for, for all of our children. Uh, you know, my question goes to uh, Mr. Hawley. You know, I, I uh, heard your testimony with respect to uh, energy poverty, I think, as you described it, and, and the issues around affordability. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this. I, I think you referenced natural gas as being, quote, clean. Uh, according to the NAACP's Clean Air Task Air Force, or excuse me, Air Task Force report, African American communities face an elevated risk of cancer due to air toxic emissions from natural gas development. And over one million African Americans live in counties that face a cancer risk above the EPA's level of concern from toxins, uh, toxics emitted by natural gas facilities. So I'm curious how you would respond to that statistic. My response would be um, all, uh, all of our energy sources have some type of downside to them, even coal. Uh, we look at the uh, wind. Well, I, I, I would agree with you there, Mr. Right, right. Coal, coal certainly has look, negative impact. If I could finish, gas. sir, if I could finish. Proceed. Um, even the wind turbines this winter, a couple weeks ago, couldn't operate. 
downside. But we know for a fact that liquid gas, natural gas, is the cleanest way to, that, and the most affordable way right now for people in this country. Well, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand your comparison of, uh, of windmills to the, the toxins and potential cancer risks associated with natural gas emissions. But nonetheless, I, I will say, um, you know, I, have, I understand that you uh, have written a number of editorials, and, and obviously from your testimony today, um, support the development of fossil fuel of fossil fuels, coal, energy exploration, gas. energy exploration. And I understand that your organization, Reaching America, um, that you've utilized that organization to, to make those views known. Is that, is that a fair? That's a fair assessment. Uh, I also understand that your organization is a partner uh, with a group called, uh, let's see here, Explore Offshore. Is that correct? Uh, we are a member of that organization, yes. Okay, and that is a project of the American Petroleum Institute. Uh, yes, they are associated okay. with them, yes. Does your organization receive any funding from fossil fuel companies or no, corporations? No, we do not. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Goldberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm curious, uh, from, your, uh, you, from your testimony, it sounds like uh, you support the Green New Deal. Is that Fair? That's correct. Okay. Well, is, uh, you'd mentioned your position as a uh, chaplain in the military, and some of us have real concerns about closing uh, every base and cutting our military by 50%, but that's interesting that you support those. Um, what the military has spoken was one of the key institutions of our government that actually has spoken about the threats of climate change. Right. And that's, uh, but that Green New Deal is going to take care of that by making us basically indefensible with uh, the 50 percent cut. Uh, we will not be able to protect ourselves properly from the threat of Russia, China, or even uh, ISIS from there, but, and, and closing all bases overseas. But that's interesting. But I, I also, um, I couldn't help as I listen to uh, Mr. Hawley, your testimony, think back to um, just a giant here in the U.S. Congress named John Dingell. He was chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee when uh, Democrats took the majority back in January of 07 through January of 11. Um, I mean, for 50 years, he and, as I understand, his father had wanted some kind of universal health care, and he was thrilled that he was going to get to chair that into being. Um, but my understanding was the Speaker of the House, um, now Speaker again, wanted two things out of his committee. They wanted uh, the universal health care bill, Obamacare, and cap and trade, and he made the public statement because that jacks up the cost of energy like you've been talking about and as you know the people that are impacted it isn't the rich they can afford it and so he made the statement the cap and trade bill is not only a tax it's a great big tax and of course the nation's poor were the ones that would be most impacted but because of his comment, he was uh, fired as chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, Mr. Waxman was made chairman, and as he famously said, we not only don't want your input, we don't need your votes, and so he pushed it through. Um, and it, it, it never became law. But it, as you testified, that does come back to mind. And I had an 80-year-old lady say, I am scared. Uh, my cost of energy to heat my home is going up. And I was born in a home that only had a wood-burning stove, and I'm afraid I'm going to die in a home that only can afford a wood-burning stove. And I said, I'm really sorry to be the bearer of bad tidings, but probably your wood-burning stove is going to end up being illegal. Uh, but... It is tragic, and it is the poor that suck it up uh, when we push these kinds of things. Um, so I appreciate your perspective very much. Dr. Curry, let me ask you very quickly. Um, has there ever been any climate uh, 
change more dramatically than what uh, killed off the dinosaurs? Well, climate has always uh, varied. Um, sometimes there are extreme events that may be, you know, an asteroid or comet impact or something like that. But the ocean, volcanic eruptions, there's all sorts, all many sources of natural variability on all time scales. So. When you see the climate changing, you can't immediately assume that it's all caused by humans. There's a strong natural... Do you think we're causing the polar ice caps on Mars to melt? Uh, no. That's probably the sun, apparently. <laughs> but let me... My time's running out, but I appreciate all our witnesses. But when it, the comparison of the civil rights effort, uh, I mean, that was unconstitutional activity by the government and it just strikes me so ironic that if the climate change and the gr the green new deal comes into law it's saying we're giving up our freedom and putting all our faith in the government that caused the civil rights violations to begin with it's just rather ironic but my time's expired i yield back well, thank you, Chair, for uh, this opportunity to finally, after many years, have a hearing on climate change. Uh, and I want to thank our witnesses, along with our governors, uh, who uh, signaled a bipartisan desire to see strong federal action. Uh, let's cut to the chase. Uh, the overwhelming scientific consensus has left no doubt, no doubt, that we are facing a climate crisis. And it's long past time to stop undermining science and evidence. The report that we saw this morning uh, from NOAA and NASA shows that the five warmest years recorded since 1880 are the last five years. This isn't that hard to figure out. Now must be the time to accept reality. This is reality and we've got to begin focusing on solutions and I want to thank the young people who are here for leading the way on initiatives like the Green New Deal. We must not wait to accelerate the deployment of renewable energy or energy efficient buildings or electrify our transportation infrastructure. And I'm from the great state of California where I've been involved in climate and energy policy for a long time and I've heard the naysayers every step of the way. But what we've done is we have demonstrated beyond any shadow of a doubt that if you protect the environment and innovate with the clean energy jobs of the future, you will grow the economy at the same time. And our solar industry in California is a clear example of that. We must also not abdicate our global leadership on the issue of climate change or subcontract our energy and environmental policies to a handful of big polluters who ignore science and common sense. And we must not sit by as unprecedented climate change impacts the health and safety and economy of our communities. Now I'm confident that a strong majority of the American people are with us, and even a strong majority of my colleagues in the House and Senate. The question is whether we have the courage to act on climate, and this hearing is just one step of many that we're going to need to take in that direction. The transition to a more sustainable future has been my life's work, and it'll be a critical aspect of my service in Congress. I hope that we can put politics aside, if even for just a moment, and focus instead on science, and evidence and our future. And like my friend Mr. Nagoose, I've got two young children at home and this is about leaving the planet better for them than how I found it. And with that, I actually do have a couple of questions for Dr. Cobb. Dr. Cobb, I want to thank you for your work. Uh, we've seen numerous studies over the past few months that climate change is wreaking havoc on ecosystems and that we've potentially lost two-thirds of all species that were on the planet before the Industrial Revolution. So why is the preservation of biodiversity so important for our resiliency to climate change and what steps can we take to preserve biodiversity, particularly as the Natural Resources Committee? Thank you for that question, the opportunity to, to address that. Um, I think we may, I made clear in the testimony that I provided that uh, any number of indicators of our ecosystem's health are already showing steady declines 
with respect to climate change impacts. The National Climate Assessment lays that out um, item by item. But to your question about biodiversity, uh, diversity of species is critical to the function of ecosystems and in turn those ecosystem services that we rely on. Uh, we might turn to the functioning of coastal ecosystems and recognize the importance of uh, functioning ecosystems to provide uh, fishermen with livelihoods and many other kinds of uh, tourist uh, related services as well. And so this has a distinct value to Americans that's been shown again and again and again. And certainly science tells us some of the ways that this committee can help to promote biodiversity and increase ecosystem resilience and therefore support the communities that depend on these services. Um, some of those ways include, as I mentioned, protecting the lands that uh, these species depend on and using the best science and evidence to inform uh, the support of these ecosystems and the critical species that, uh, that uh, support their function. So th that's just one way. Thank you very much. Well, I represent a district, California's 49th district, with over 50 miles of coastline. Uh, and my friends at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography agree with you, Dr. Cobb, that we absolutely must uh, face the reality, uh, the changing uh, temperature of our oceans, the obvious coastal erosion, uh, unprecedented. Uh, and if we don't act, uh, future generations will regret our lack of action. Now is our moment to lead. This should not be a partisan issue. This should be based on science and evidence. And if we can actually focus on facts for a change, maybe we'll get somewhere. And I yield back. I would like to, if possible, make a comment as one of two women of color that's on this panel, particularly because climate change is going to impact frontline communities more than any other, and the people who are leading are women of color in these communities, their children are the ones that are going to be impacted. We can't talk about these ecosystems devoid of talking about the impact on human rights and on the people affected. More than 5,000 Puerto Ricans died. That is not nothing. That is not just an ecosystem. That was an entire island that was affected. In the Philippines, in around 2012, 10,000 Filipinos died. We have had Superstorm Sandy that affected life all over New York City and New Jersey, and the infrastructure was destroyed. So I just really don't want to talk about this in, in silos as if the we are not talking about whole communities and, and, and not treating this issue in a way that is holistic. Um, if we don't lead with how this is going to impact the people least responsible for creating climate change, the people who live without, within their carbon footprint, the people who are engaged in urban forestry, doubling the amount of open space, stopping the siting of power plants, then we will miss I'm the not, reason why we're not cutting you off. I just, the time's up, and we want you to stay within the protocol. All right, thank you. I appreciate respect. it, but I just want to make sure thank you. that uh, folks Ms. address Hall, those things. Ms. Oh, Mr. Wickentuck, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I do want to talk about science and evidence. Uh, uh, Professor Curry, are we experiencing the highest temperatures in the planet's history? No. Uh, when have we seen higher temperatures? Oh, um, a very long time ago. Um, and there's, uh, at least in some regions, they may be equally as high about a thousand years ago during the medieval warm period. So long before the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. Of, are we experiencing the highest levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide in the planet's history? No. Historically, we're a little bit on the low side, actually, in the current era. Are we experiencing the worst droughts in recorded history? <laughs> uh, definitely not. Are we experiencing the most ferocious hurricanes in recorded history? Um, no. In recent history, in the 1950s, um, in the Atlantic, the landfalling hurricanes were actually worse than what we've seen in recent decades. I, I, I'm reminded of a poem by Ogden Nash, who, who, who wrote, uh, The ass was born in March, the rains came in November. Such a flood as this, he said, I scarcely can remember. But our recorded history, as well as our paleoclimatology, informs us that there have been periods where carbon dioxide levels have been much higher than they are today, Temperatures have been much higher and lower than they are today, uh, uh, and long before the um, uh, uh, significant uh, uh, carbon dioxide uh, uh, emissions of, of, of human civilization. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, a study published in Lancet a few years ago noted that uh, cold weather kills far more people than warm weather. Uh, what do you see as the greater threat? 
Well, obviously it depends on the location, but I think the statistics overall across a, a wide variety of locations do support that cold weather kills more than, than hot weather. Well, during the recent cold wave, uh, those states that relied excessively on wind and solar saw electricity outages. Uh, would you say that the greatest single threat in extreme weather, either hot or cold, is a lack of electricity? Yes, even during hurricanes, uh, what kills a lot of people is uh, the, the lack of electricity, which has all sorts of trickle-down effects on other things that are needed to save lives during those How, how does an over-reliance on wind and solar generation affect our ability to provide abundant, reliable, and affordable electricity? Well, it doesn't work without natural gas. Natural gas is the perfect partner for uh, wind and solar because of the intermittency, uh, because you can fire up a gas burner and fire it back down. And energy trading, natural gas trading, is what has, I think, stabilized the price of natural gas that actually helps make wind and solar be affordable. So until such time as there is advanced uh, storage technologies, we're going let, to rely to on that. natural gas as a partner. Let me get to that if I can. M Mr. Hawley, we heard earlier from the governor of Massachusetts about all of their green energy policies, also the governor of South Carolina. Uh, my home state of California has adopted even more radical policies. They say they're helping the poor, but I just checked. In, in Massachusetts, those policies have produced the 11th highest gasoline prices in the country. California now has, as a result of these policies, the second highest gasoline prices in the country. Uh, Massachusetts and California are tied for the sixth highest electricity prices in the country. How are poor people helped by paying needlessly sky-high prices for gasoline and electricity? Sir, you know, I... I don't have a lot of research to point to. All I have is my anecdotal research. When I speak to the thousands of people that I speak to who struggle every single day to pay their electric bill, and the one thing that they talk about is just the need for affordable, reliable energy that we have here in this country. So if we can find a way to reduce the regulations that allow people access to that energy, I think it would go a long way in helping them to reduce the cost of energy for them. Uh, Dr. Curry, uh, a gridlock car creates twice the NOx contaminants and six times the carbon contaminants per mile traveled as a car moving at peak efficiency. Um, doesn't it make more sense to add highway capacity to resolve our chronic traffic congestion if carbon emissions are, uh, are, are the goal of reducing? Uh, in a transportation policy is, is much tougher to figure out than power production. And it's a very complex issue. And we need to, and I would like to see us like re-envision what that should be for the 21st century rather than adding patches to our current system. If, if we're going to be able to store less moisture in the mountains as snow, um, does it make sense to build more dams so that we can store surplus water from wet years so that we have it in dry years? Um, it, it certainly does. Like uh, water resource management is a big issue. Um, at, but there are environmental challenges associated with dams and reservoirs also, so it needs a lot of planning to make all this do what you really want it to do. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, welcome to all of you, and thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you and my colleagues for entrusting me with the responsibilities of vice chair of this committee and the chairship for the subcommittee on national parks, forests, and public lands. I look forward to working with you and my colleagues to protect our public lands and to meet our obligations to our indigenous communities. To that point, this hearing is important and an appropriate place to begin this Congress. As we heard from all our witnesses, climate change poses an unprecedented threat to our communities and our environment. Last year, in my state of New Mexico, the U Park fire burned tens of thousands of drought-stricken acres, while the city of Santa Fe experienced once-in-a-thousand-year flood. Meanwhile, a vast methane cloud hovers over the northwest corner of New Mexico, and this administration has worked to weaken the rules on methane emissions from oil and gas operations. Methane is more than 80 times more powerful than carbon dioxide at trapping heat and is responsible for about a quarter of the warming we are experiencing today. 
Nearby in Arizona, Hurricane Rosa inundated the Tohono O'odham Nation, nearly overtopping their dam, trapping residents behind impassable roads, and forcing evacuations. Hurricanes have almost never reached this part of Arizona before. Climate change has forced us to live in a new normal in which fires and floods, droughts and hurricanes wreck our communities and our natural heritage, and it's now time for us to act. I first would like to just thank Ms. Nazar for your commitment and your sacrifice to the things you believe in. I, I, am, I almost want to apologize to you and the youth of this world who go to bed every night worrying about what will happen to our communities because of climate change. And I just want to recognize your um, presence here. It means a great deal to me and to many of us. So thank you very much. Um, Ms. Yampierre, I think you are best equipped to answer this question, so I'll ask it to you. Right now, the EPA and Interior Department are run by former lobbyists for coal and oil companies. The New York Times reported last year that a coal magnate was essentially getting his entire wish list of energy deregulations approved by this administration. What role do you believe this corporate capture of the administration will play in being able to address the climate crisis? I think that the deregulation is exacerbating um, the climate crisis, particularly in frontline communities and indigenous communities. You're from New Mexico where you've got nuclear energy and uranium in the lungs and the, and the water and people. It's affecting 60 nations and tribes. Um, the decisions that are being made to support an old school way of thinking about energy are really racing us towards uh, extreme catastrophic events. The truth is that even in places like Kentucky, people are moving away from coal. One of our organizations, was, which is with the Climate Justice Alliance, Kentuckians for the Commonwealth, are working at operationalizing just transitions that move people away from having to depend on an economic system that has destroyed their lives and limited their livability. And so while people in communities are doing that, you've got an EPA that is racing towards in, in capture, uh, moving policies that are basically taking us back in time. So. So it is really dangerous, um, and it is a contribution to actually making us look like the day after tomorrow. And it is unfortunate that this old school, dated way of thinking about how we have, how we basically consume and use energy, uh, is is really creating um, more problems for our communities. I think that honestly. Uh, people in different parts of the world are, are way ahead of us and that the United States is really looking like this clunky old school machine um, that can't keep up not only with the technology but the, but, but the science. And so uh, it's frightening. EPA has always had people in there that are in the pockets of the lobbyists. Uh, really slowing down the cogs and making it impossible for us to move as fast as the climate is changing. And so now what we're seeing is really dangerous. Um, so I, that, that's what I would contribute. I, I appreciate that very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in the interest of time, I will submit other questions in writing. Thank you. Mr. Hearn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for testifying today as expert witnesses on climate change. Each of you has spent your careers involved in climate policy and have helped to generate various solutions to the problem of climate change. Mr. Hawley, your, your work to reduce energy poverty has been truly remarkable, and your testimony today reflects your well-versed stances on climate change issues. One part of your testimony that uh, interests me a lot was where you wrote, the government requires, quote, the government requires environmental impact studies to estimate the effects of projects like roads and buildings on nature. Shouldn't the government act similarly when, we, when it comes to how regulations impact the population? In yes, quotes. Sir. Would it surprise you that we tried to put that into a rule last week and it was voted down by our friends across the aisle? So we would evaluate the impact of our policies on uh, you know, cost-benefit analysis. Sure. I, no, I did not know that, sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Curry, um, your testimony reflects your wealth of knowledge on these issues and gives great insight into the climate change debate. In particular, you're discussing the increasing concern you have that the climate change problem has been oversimplified. I agree with this statement. 
as I feel that an overly simple one-size-fits-all, we're smarter than everybody else in Washington, D.C., as we heard our opening statements today from our ranking member, uh, approach to climate change should lead to serious issues as what may work for one state may not work for another. Would you please elaborate on the problems that an expensive one-size-fits-all top-down type of solution might cause if, if implemented? Well, a whole host of unintended consequences, which um, some of which we can't even imagine right now. And because of that, you know, we, we need to avoid the hubris of thinking that we can predict what the future climate will do and that we can actually control the climate. Um, I think if we were somehow successful in putting all these policies into place and getting CO2 emissions down to zero, I think we would be unpleasantly surprised at how little impact this actually has on the things that worry us most about extreme weather events and things like that. Sea level rise is not, we're not going to turn that one on a dime, things like that. It's very tough to change the climate, has a whole lot of inertia in the system, many time scales. Pacific responds very slowly. So, you know, even with success in reducing CO2 emissions down to zero, it would be a long time to turn the corner on having that actually impact the climate. So we need to do some of the more bottom-up type things. And the states are wonderful laboratories for trying out all these um, adaptation resilience kind of policies. And I think we should, you know, try to figure out how to help that flourish, the, the, the so-called innovation dividend. Uh, since you brought that up, uh, last week I had the fortunate opportunity. We have a organization called Grand River Dam Authority that uh, is a public-private partnership in our state of Oklahoma that uh, has been around since the 30s, uh, that was uh, formed originally by the government uh, through some grants to build some dams to lock up energy so that we could use that to uh, handle flooding on the Arkansas River, the McClellan Kerr navigation system as it came to be in the 1960s. Um, we also have in our uh, industrial park in Pryor, Oklahoma, the largest Google server farm in their company. Uh, it relocated there to take over Gatorade plant with the qualification that they were, uh, were only used renewable power. Uh, we had a conscious decision, even though it's not in my district, the state, the GRDA, had a conscious decision to make on free market enterprise. Do we want that there? Do we want to go through the cost of upgrading the grid, upgrading the technology to conform to the purchase of Google's 100 megawatts of Rex? And felt like the cost benefit analysis of that made sense. It was a small plant at that time. It has since quadrupled in size. And from all the Google people that I've talked to, they're so proud of the relationship in a free market environment. Uh, working with renewable credits to get to where they're at so that on the grid, GRDA has a great mixture of hydro, uh, solar, wind, coal, and natural gas. To the testimony from Mr. Hawley earlier, that you have to have backups on this so that the cost of uh, having a battery type environment when you don't have solar and you don't have wind, that you can actually have power to fuel and to warm our homes and businesses around our, our particular districts and our states and our country. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. I yield back my time. Thanks, Mr. McEachin. Thanks, Chair. First of all, I want to thank you for your leadership on the most urgent threat facing our planet, climate change. I want to thank the panelists for being here today. And in particular, I'm very happy to see my good friend, Reverend Yearwood, here today. Reverend, I've enjoyed working with you over the past... Thank you. Reverend, I've enjoyed working with you over the past uh, two years, and I look forward to our continued partnership. In that vein, Reverend, I want to start with you. Um, amazingly, it's been articulated today that there is a mistaken idea that moving towards a clean energy economy will hurt low-income communities and communities of color. I need you to speak to what the rising health and economic costs of climate change will be for those communities, spe specifically if we fail to move in that direction. Thank you, Congressman, uh, for, that, for that question. First, we can definitely fight poverty and pollution at the same time. Um, and let me say 
clearly that the assessment that Mr. Holly respectfully, um, I disagree completely with what he put forth as the um, um, idea that people of color are not concerned about the climate, about climate change, about the environment, about their health, um, in that aspect. I think, I think that one of the things here, and, that as, and we know that 200,000 uh, Americans are dying yearly because of air pollution. We know that we have millions of children and millions of adults who have asthma, emphysema, and are getting cancer. We know that 68% of people of color, particularly black people, are living within 30 miles of coal-fired power plants. We know that the deregulations of the mercury rule and, and the car rule and, the, 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 and many of the rules being put, that being rolled back by EPA would hurt people of color. And so one of the things here that I just want to say, and this is Mr. Holly, please understand what, what reason why I was making this assessment, is this. For me, as a minister, having buried a young, a young girl because of asthma, that mother no longer cares about how much that utility bill would have, would have, would have cost. That child I had to bury because of asthma, she would have much more been concerned about t dealing with a particular matter in the atmosphere. And so the health concerns are one of the key concerns that are within the communities of color. The idea that we are not also concerned about our future and future generation is frankly absurd. The idea that we don't care that the slurs are rising and that we are, will be first and worst, will be hurt by climate change is outlandish. The fact for me, being from Louisiana and seeing what happened in, in, in with Hurricane Katrina and with, or, or Harvey in Houston, those are the kind of things that have a huge impact on communities of color. So to sit up here honestly at this critical moment and to then purport the idea that people of color are somehow making the decision that they are more concerned about their energy bill than their health, their energy bill than their life, then that is out. That is literally ludicrous. If you think anybody, and, had, and it was come to earlier about with, with, with this was, uh, Black History Month and Civil Rights, the idea that also that poverty is also put upon with communities of color is also outlandish. That we know this is not about just poor people of color, but poor white people are also due to the fact of the matter that they want clean air and clean water. As I said earlier, climate change is a civil rights issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reverend. Uh, am I pronouncing this correctly? Is it Jean Pierre, Mr. Jean Pierre? Jean-Pierre, yes. Um, you know, how do we make sure that as we move towards a clean uh, energy economy that we invest greener technologies in communities, in, in low-income communities and communities of color so they're not left behind? How do we do that? Whether, whether it's in Michigan, whether it's in Detroit or in Brooklyn, New York or Richmond, California, where there's fracking going on in people's backyards, um, communities of color and frontline communities, whether they're in Indian country, are working on operationalizing just transitions. They're looking at different economies of scale. Anything from community-owned solar to trying to figure out how they can create food systems that will withstand the changes that are coming. And there has to be an investment in those communities. And we also need to start thinking about governance differently. Climate change is going to disrupt governance. And so the idea is that we need to start creating transformational partnerships with communities that are in the front line and that are engaging in this kind of transformation. The other thing is that the needs are different everywhere in the country. So the needs of a rural community are not the same of an urban community. Folks that are dealing with mountaintop removal in Appalachia are dealing with different kinds of challenges. And so it isn't cookie cutter, but it is uh, a commitment to trying to work with people on the ground and being led by the ground in partnership because that's what it's going to take. Climate change is not going to, it, it is not going to, um, top-down solutions are not going to be sustained over time. 
Uh, they just don't work. Uh, people on the ground are going to have to lead, and we're going to have to be partners in those kinds of decisions. So, and sharing and creating a space where we share expertise and information with each other. Um, when Reverend is talking about Louisiana, in my mind, all I'm thinking about was those floating black bodies. As people of African ancestry, that is the truth for all of us all over the United States, right? I think about Puerto Rico. I think about Louisiana. And so I think that it's really important that those communities that are leading and are doing the work, that they not be marginalized and that they be supported and invested in. Thank you so much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Huh? Mr. Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to concentrate with my questions and comments on the proposals that are out there to deal with climate change. Uh, I don't want to talk about climate change, the science behind it, the man-made role. Um, I want to talk about the proposals that are on the table to deal with it. And the main proposal that I've seen so far is the Green New Deal. Now, I hear that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle may have some um, uh, proposals coming forward to flesh this out, but right now all we have is the Green New Deal. Uh, and we already have presidential contenders endorsing it. Uh, we have the Green Party that's talked a lot about it. I'm going to use a few of their facts and figures. They say, and if you go to gp.org, uh, that the transition to a Green New Deal will cost $13 trillion. Uh, $13 trillion. Uh, right now, here's our dependence on hydrocarbons. 82% of U.S. electricity is generated from coal, natural gas, and nuclear, leaving 18% from renewables and hydropower. When it comes to transportation, uh, we have 30,000 commercial air flights a day. I don't think any, not a single one of those is powered by uh, renewables. We have 250 million cars and trucks on the road, and people in the U.S. travel 11 billion miles a day. Uh, and, and the vast majority of that is hydrocarbon powered. Some, some electric vehicles, some alternatives like propane and biofuel. Um, the Department of Defense in particular, I'm also on the Armed Services Committee, uh, they spend a lot of money on energy, $13 billion a year. Uh, much of that, if not most of that, is uh, hydrocarbon based. Now according to the Green Party, uh, in their plan for the Green New Deal, uh, we would have to close all overseas bases and we would lay off 1.4 million people, both military and civilian. Um, to me, that's, extreme, that's very extreme. And this is to do something with the goal of no hydrocarbons by the year 2030, 11 years from now. So I'm going to just ask, I'll start with you, um, Dr. Hawley, is that realistic? <laughs> no, sir. Um, and you actually mentioned um, that 80% uh, of our total uh, energy sources come from fossil fuels. I know that it's been that way since the turn of the century. It was that way when my grandfather was a black coal miner in southwest Virginia. It was that way when I was working for Norfolk Southern. And even the last EPA director, Gina McCarthy, under the Obama administration, stated that fossil fuels, we're going to need them at least through 2050. And Dr. Curry? Well, the problem that I see with a massively ambitious top-down policy like the Green New Deal is, A, what if we can't do it? <laughs> what if we're wrong? And there's all sorts of things. It, it's not a problem that's amenable to that kind of a solution. That's why I propose more of a bottom-up kind of approach. Um, so we can, you know, the so-called innovation dividend, lots of, try lots of different things, lots of solutions, and, you know, see what works. I, I have to really agree with you. I think that the ingenuity and hard work and creativity of the American people is a real solution here and should not be left out. We shouldn't, like you said, top down from government coercion, government control. That sounds too much like a... Soviet five-year plan or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, which is simply not going to work. Now, I understand that if someone comes into Congress, you, you only have to be 25 years old to be a member of Congress. And we have 
young people that bring a lot of great qualities, but maybe they don't bring a lot of life experience. And so I, understand, I guess I can understand if someone has not a lot of life experience and they're proposing something that's extremely unrealistic. Well, well, impossible. Impossible. But what I don't understand is if adults and grown-ups uh, who are older and more mature are also advocating something that's impossible. And, and I see that with some of the presidential contenders who are throwing their names out there. They're plugging for something that is literally impossible. With that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm going to yield back the balance of my time. Well, let me, let me put a pitch in for myself. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, no, I, we, I just want to say to all the, movements have been led by young people. We, we have all to movements, the protocol. civil rights, know, divestment in South Africa, all led by young people. Let's not try to put them in a box. Ma'am, the protocol and decorum for this, with all due respect, please, I mean, we're trying to run this meeting uh, in, in the way that uh, is orderly, and while you might have an opinion and want to interject it at that moment, unless you're recognized, you can't. I appreciate that. Uh, let me put in a plug for myself, Mr. Lambert, as an old-timer. Uh, I happen to agree with what some of our colleagues are saying here today, and some of our witnesses have said today. I don't know if that puts me out of step with my age group, but... Uh, I would suggest that the vast majority of Americans feel the way I do. But anyway, Ms. Velasquez. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman and the ranking member. I am very proud um, to be the representative of a leading voice and activist on climate change, Ms. Elizabeth Jampier. Thank you for your service and for your activism. I would like to ask you the first question. As an advocate for climate justice, with its ethical and political implications, what would you say to someone who thinks we should ignore climate change despite low-income communities being disproportionately at risk from its impact? Um, Congresswoman, it's wonderful to see you. Um, you've been a champion for environmental justice for years, since even before it became a sexy thing. Um, you've been doing it for all of your districts for so many years that I'm, I'm honored to, to be speaking in front of you. Um, I don't engage climate deniers. I think it slows us down and wastes our time. I engage people who are at the margins, who don't know that they're living at the intersection of injustice and climate change. And I try to inspire and provide information to those people so that they know that their lives are at risk and the future of their children is at risk. Um, I want folks in our communities to know that things like um, uh, power plants that are run by, um, by gas produce NOx, SOx, uh, PM 2.5, and, and all of those particulates that get trapped in the air passages of our children and our elders because our elders are going to be tremendously vulnerable in the face of climate change. And so that's what I do. I try to reach people's hearts and minds, but first they need to have hearts and minds. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Perner, in which countries do you see businesses making the greatest efforts towards addressing climate change? And why is that the case? Thank you. And I'm sorry if this question has been asked. No, no. I was absent from this important hearing because I'm the chair of the Small Business Committee and we were holding a hearing on the government's shutdown impact on small businesses. So. Well, first of all, the question wasn't asked. And secondly, as a New Yorker, I'm also delighted to see you and thank you for your decades and years of service. Um, with regard to companies in our country, it isn't that they're not doing anything. On the contrary, they see the risks, as I said earlier, and um, uh, are being uh, driven to take proactive measures to protect their business supply chains and so on. But with regard to your question, these companies operate in a global environment more and more. And so, for example, you have the European Union, which has um, instigated very, very strong uh, regulations, particularly looking at the fiduciary responsibility of companies and are they operating within parameters that recognize the risks they may face. And of course, shareholders are ordinary people very often. They're not just rich people. 401ks are involved. With regard to some interesting things going on, for example, uh, China. Um, I know there's lots of controversy about China, but China is 
has uh, declared an ecological civilization. It's built into their national uh, program. They're, they're making tremendous investments in solar energy. Morocco has taken tremendous steps to uh, establish targets. And with all due respect to all the debate, this is not an either-or situation. Precisely, we need an energy mix. Precisely, we have to use a bit of natural gas to make uh, renewables less, uh, less expensive. I mean, this is definitely not an either-or. And it's certainly not a choice between top-down or bottom-up. Uh, this is a very complex problem which has been stated. Everybody has a stake in it, and companies are very much benefiting and would benefit from a smoothing of the requirements so that they don't have to have certain kind of different operations one country to the other. That's very expensive. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Jean-Pierre, a huge barrier for sustainable communities, whether large or small, seems to be man uh, management, waste management. As a member of the Transform Dump Trash campaign, how can we urge largely populated cities to be aggressive when asking steps toward zero waste? I was invited uh, to speak um, in Amsterdam um, by an, uh, an international organization that is trying to get businesses to become more sustainable and take responsibility for their for their practices. Um, all over the world, businesses know that they will suffer and they will lose, um, they will lose income uh, because of climate change. And then locally, we've been working with small businesses to become climate adaptable because they're literally the heart of, of the economic driver in our community. Um, so I think it's going towards zero waste is really important. When we started working with the small businesses and we were trying to get them to move away from um, uh, what do you call that, the um, styrofoam. We also presented them with alternatives that were affordable and the idea of creating cooperatives so that they could reduce the cost. There's all kinds of things that we can do with businesses so that we can move them away uh, from using products and working in a way that makes them unsustainable. And so, and that's happening locally. Thank you. I yield back my time. Thank the Chairman. Uh, I just heard that we're citing China as being a, a good actor. A net increase in new coal plants were built in 2017 with China accounting for 34 of the 61 megawatts that were actually generated. Wow, China is the biggest polluter in the, in the world. India right behind them. Mr. Hawley, I, I, I gotta come back to you. Now I've heard statements that climate impacts different communities. Yes, sir. What communities are hit most by the policies like the Green New Deal? Minority and low income communities. Um, just because we cannot afford the rising costs that will be associated with these policies. And like I said, many people are struggling right now to pay their, pay their energy bills. Well, this is interesting because I keep hearing this thing about energy. Um, are you familiar with baseload energy versus intermittent energy? Somewhat. Okay, so I guess what we have to look at is baseload energy it happens all the, all the time, 24-7. Yes, but intermittent is like solar and wind, where... If the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, we don't you get it. work. Okay, right. so there's a very big difference along those applications. The problem that we got with baseload energy with with new en new technology is molten salts, batteries don't work real well. Uh, the other side is not interested in rare earths, you know, in the mining capacities of those that actually help us with new technology called battery capacity. So we got a problem because. It's convenient in Phoenix, Arizona, when you need energy at the middle of the day when you don't get it, or at nighttime when temperatures are at 120. It's kind of hard to tell minority groups, just live with it. Yes, sir, I would agree with that. And that's one of the things that I would disagree with the Reverend here. I, I never said that, you know, we don't agree that climate change does not exist. However, my point is, until we find a way, a solution, to harness those renewables to sustain ourselves, then we got to use what we got. Uh, and we have an abundance of affordable and reliable energy in this country, and we need to use it. Oh, I agree. In fact, one of the companies in, in northern Scottsdale in Arizona uses uh, sun during the day and gas at night because it delivers uniform delivery around our, our grid. So very important to do that. But I want to concentrate on something else. I mean, uh, I, I'm a dentist, so science is a big deal to me. And... You know, if we're talking about carbon sequestration, it seems to me like what we want to have is a very dynamic, engaging forest. Dr. Curry, would you agree? Oh, I think uh, land use 
is a very big deal, including... Well, I want to get more specific. Photosynthesis. Or, yeah, for... It's, it's like plants take in clean oxygen, right, and produces carbon dioxide. No. They take in carbon dioxide, produce oxygen. They take in dirty water, produce clean water. So it seems to me, if we really want to address this, we want to look at the best carbon trap we got, which is a healthy, vibrant forest. And I've heard over and over again that climate change is the problem with our forest burning up. That's not the case. I'm from Arizona. Ponderosa forests are 40 to 60 trees per acre. That's fact. That's what a healthy forest should look like. But what we have, because of lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit, we have 800 to 1,000 trees per acre. So these starving trees rise to the sunlight and what ends up happening is when we get these fires, they're no longer landscape fires on the grasslands, they're treetop fires. And I, I want to quote exactly what we saw last year. Wildfires, this is political, politifact. Wildfires produce more of one key pollutant, particulate matter, that, and then cars both in California and nationwide. Particulate matter is a mixture of microscopic particles and liquid droplets that when inhaled can affect the heart and lungs and cause serious health problems. End of quote. I, I heard this all along this panel right here about asthma and all that stuff. Listen to this. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, wildfires in California in 2018 released enough roughly equivalent of 86 million tons of heat-trapping carbon dioxide, the same amount of carbon emissions that are produced in a year providing electricity for an entire state. So if we're going to concentrate on this carbon sequestration, I think we ought to be looking at our forests being adaptive. I mean, we, I, I'm part of the Western Caucus. We had a number of different uh, opportunities to look at good neighbor. In fact, one of the most liberal bastions in my state, Coconino County, actually passed a bond levy to actually start thinning the forest so they had a dynamic interface to stop the fire, number one, and number two is get it more dynamic for carbon sequestration. Would you agree with all those synopsis, Dr. Curry? Um, most of it. Um, it, it. The life cycle of a forest is com, you know, has a complex interaction with CO2. At some point, it becomes not so much of a sequestration. So managing forests to prevent wildfires and to maximize the CO2 uptake is certainly a sensible policy. And one quick indulgence. You know, a, a dynamic forest is young trees, medium growth trees, and old growth trees. Because what we know is young, young and medium growth trees produce more carbon uh, or oxygen mm -hmm. uh, than they do carbon. As the older the tree gets, the less they do. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I am very excited that you have given us this opportunity to uh, really have a robust discussion around climate change. This is uh, an issue that is uh, very important um, to each of us individually, collectively, uh, to the future of our children. Uh, my oldest son, who's now a freshman in college, uh, asks me all the time, when is Congress going to act? to address the issues of climate change. And so, um, as we've heard uh, here today, the impacts of climate change become greater every year. Uh, in my home state of Nevada, a desert state, it is particularly vulnerable to the changing climate. By 2050, it is projected that the city of Las Vegas will experience 106 days per year with temperatures upwards of 105 degrees. To provide context, Las Vegas currently averages 70 days per year with temperatures more than 100 degrees. It's hot in Vegas, but the fact that we're having those many days per year over 100 degrees is just one example. Even more concerning, by 2050, the typical number of heat wave days in Nevada is projected to increase from 15 days per year to 55 days per year. According to the Ready Public Service Campaign of the Department of Homeland Security, extreme heat results in the highest number of annual deaths among all weather-related hazards. Mr. Chairman, sadly, seniors and children are at greatest risk of death during heat waves. Lake Mead which supplies water to more than 90% of Las Vegas and roughly 25 million people throughout Nevada, California, and Arizona continue to deplete 
at an alarming rate due to increasing temperatures caused by climate change. And in 2016, Lake Mead, which is fed by the Colorado River, reached its lowest level on record and now holds just 37% of its original capacity. As occurrence of extreme heat rises, the depletion of the Colorado River and Lake Mead is projected to worsen in the future. Additionally, more than 1.2 million people living in Nevada, or 46% of our state's population, live in areas at elevated risk of wildfire. As extreme temperatures increase, especially in drought years, the risk of wildfires will continue to rise. So the people of Nevada, like people across the United States, they're, they're looking for solutions. And they are looking for this Congress to act. So Ms. Uh, DePerna, I want to ask you whether uh, your organization, which works with businesses to understand the business investor impacts, um, if you can talk to me about the heat waves and drought and how they are a significant concern and how water issues, particularly uh, around companies and investors, um, are dealing with this particular issue and if there are examples uh, that you know um, in our home state in Nevada. Well, as a matter of fact, right today we're having our uh, supply chain conference in Las Vegas. And as I mentioned in my testimony, Caesars Entertainment is very concerned about the cost of water. They have uh, facilities in, 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 in uh, very dry areas, Southern Africa and so on. Uh, Dr. Pepper, I mentioned, also concerned. Every company is worried about water. And I, uh, uh, Dr. Cobb mentioned, are using internal internal carbon prices to gauge the potential cost of these sort of hidden hitchhikers, which are these tons that go up into the atmosphere that we don't see, but which cost us something. So people are using an internal carbon price in anticipation of regulation or to deal with existing regulations in the jurisdictions where they are covered by regulation. On the water matter, because of increasing water scarcity, companies have begun to also set an internal water price because they, they need to begin to come to terms with the increasing cost of water, the increasing scarcity, and even more to the point, the increasing uh, lack of usability. You know, water is potable or usable. We're beginning to have less potable and certainly less usable unless we spend a lot of money to clean it. Now here's where the impact on the poor is potentially cat catastrophic because they will pass that, they will have to price pass that co cost they will, pass that, they will have to price pass that co cost on. There will never be one other drop of water on this earth. It's all here. And so you can't make water. So we're into an ultimate scarcity there. And I think that uh, I can provide you with a lot of information from our water disclosure. Their company after company is concerned about water, and the IT industry in particular, because they, they, they need to cool those uh, data centers with water. And so their energy costs are climbing, uh, uh, cooling is becoming a very big cost. So, you know, there, it is a complex system. You can't tease out one little bit, but you're the government of the entire country. And so we all look to you to uh, put all the pieces together. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Cobb, I missed some of your, your comments earlier, but I understand you had, you had raised concerns about energy production in fisheries, and I, I just wanted to make note that uh, home state of Louisiana, we, we produce more offshore energy in the federal waters than any other state. In fact, I think if you take the other states that produce, the other five states that produce and multiply times four, that's how much offshore energy we produce. We're also the top fisheries producer in terms of commercial fisheries in the continental United States. So there, there is a habitat that's created by uh, the, 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 the energy infrastructure. I don't think we've done a great job managing that in regard to, um, I, I think we can take advantage of rigs to reefs programs and others, but I did just want to make note that that's really the hotbed ecosystem uh, or habitat for many of the fisheries in, in Louisiana. Um, but in the first panel, I, I brought up a letter from May of, of 2018. That letter was signed by Senator Schumer, Senator Cantwell, Senator Menendez, and Senator Markey. That letter was written to the President of the United States asking that the President work with our OPEC um, allies to increase, to increase global oil production. Let's say that again. Senator Menendez, Senator Markey, Senator Cantwell, and Senator Schumer, uh, May of 2018, asking the president to work with OPEC to increase oil production. 
um, because prices, saying that increased production will result in lower energy prices. Um, yet, it was interesting in that the first panel, some of the governors that were here uh, talked about how their efforts to um, uh, help to reduce emissions were, were benefiting everyone. But, but I looked, for example, the state of, of Massachusetts that was represented here, their kilowatt hour electricity cost was more than twice that, more than 200% that of, of my home state of Louisiana, uh, which I, I just thought was interesting. Um, uh, Mr. Holly, I'm just curious, could you share any reflections on it, it, just that balance of how do we pursue um, a, a climate policy agenda legislation while at the same time not adversely affect our citizens? And how do we strike that balance? Yes, sir. I actually had the chance to visit your state over the summer. Come back any time, any of you. <laughs> um, out down to Port Fouchon, where we saw, where I had the opportunity to see where all the onshore operations take place for all the offshore. And I also was down there when I took the tour um, of Port Fouchon. They talked about how countries come, around, come, come from around the world to study the Gulf because it's so rich in wildlife in the environment. And so what that says to me is that energy exploration can coexist with wildlife and the environment. And so as long as that we have that to look at and, 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 and use as a gauge, I think that's a great place to start. Thank you. And, and let me be clear, um, we, we, we have some extraordinary coastal challenges. And Ms. Yempierre, did I do that okay? Um, uh, we can engage. I'm, I'm, I'm not a climate denier. I, I just, I, I've really struggled with how we find the right balance and, 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 and sort of criteria that we use here to move forward on legislation. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, uh, Dr. Curry, one of the, the, the rule changes that I tried to make in this committee last week was a rule that would uh, cause us to evaluate the, the job impacts and economic impacts and, and try and quantify te temperature and sea rise impacts and other things on legislation we progressed. Do you have any thoughts on how do we properly use criteria or metrics to determine which legislation is actually going to be helpful in balance and what may be weighted too hard toward job losses or too hard toward other things that it's not really advancing a, a public win or a public goal. Does that, does that make sense? Well, sort of. Um, th this is why I call, you know, climate change a wicked once problem. Once in a while makes sense. You know, why myself and others refer to it as a wicked problem. Um, you know, it, it's hard to even define the problem. You know, the boundaries just seem to ever expand. Um, the impacts are very wide. Um, no matter what policy we propose, there's bound to be unintended consequences. So it, it, it's a big challenge to, to sort through all that. And... The, the approach to me that seems to work the best is where communities and states work to secure their common interest, which are very specific to their location, their o economy, their population, their vulnerabilities, as we try to um, sort through this rather than a big top-down mandate. So that's my thinking on the subject. I wish there was a simple silver bullet solution, but there isn't. Thank you. And to comply with my commitment, I'm going to yield back my eight seconds. Uh, those are that the bell was about uh, votes being called. Uh, before uh, adjourning the meeting, uh, let me thank the panels, the second panel. Uh, as uh, many of the questions and perspectives my colleagues have brought up when they asked you questions and uh, rather than repeat the same ones over again. Let me just thank Ms. Nazar. Thank you very much. I think your presence here and your testimony talks about us looking beyond our nose as members of Congress. Think about the future, your generation, generations to follow. And this issue of climate change, what I did learn today that maybe we are not in full-blown, full-throated denial as we were. We're into a different phase, which is climate change avoidance. And what can we do to stall, change, tinker with the science, raise issues that, uh, raise issues that, uh, that are meant to uh, slow any solution seeking or policies or legislative initiatives as to deal with this very urgent problem. Uh, Ms. Jean-Pierre and, and Reverend, thank you very much. 
uh, the frontline communities and communities most impacted disparate, in a disparate way by unabated climate change and no solution seeking and, and an afterthought in the policy making, you made sure that those are front and center in the discussion around issues of justice, equity, access, and inclusion. And I want to thank you for that. That is very, very important. Um, too often we make policies at this level and then have to backtrack because obviously the impact was never dealt with. And as we seek solutions, equity has got to be part of the discussion all the way down. Uh, Dr. Cobb, thank you very much. And uh, uh, bringing to bear what I think is essential in the solution seeking is empirical information and science. And we'll go from there. Uh, have, that having been absent in the last two years, uh, that is not no longer going to be the case. Uh, we should be guide, our guidepost needs to be science and facts and empirical information. And if those are the guideposts, we can move forward. And I, and I have every intention to make sure that's central to the discussion. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Ms. DiPerna for uh, bringing to light about businesses. And, and, and uh, with or without regulations that uh, in anticipation of what is coming, they're preparing. And just as the economic engines of this uh, country of us in this world are preparing for climate change, uh, we should be preparing for everyone else to make sure that we confront this and deal with it. And so I appreciate your information very much. And on that note, let me thank you. It's the first hearing. I appreciate your indulgence as I failed to manage the clock a a accurately, but it all worked out. Uh, and we'll go forward. Each subcommittee will now take upon itself uh, from this committee to have a similar hearing dealing with that jurisdiction as we go forward. Uh, this committee, as Mr. Bishop said, has a lot under the jurisdiction. We feel we're 25%, 20, over 20% of the legislative adaptation and solution. Uh, public lands, waters, oceans, and the jurisdiction that is broad and we intend to pursue it that way. Uh, it's a task that uh, we can't ignore, and your testimony today made it abundantly clear that's something we can't ignore and an urgency we, we must deal with uh, with haste and not stall, avoid, or ignore it. Thank you very much. Meetings adjourned. Pleasure.